title of my message is Strategies for Battle. Strategies for Battle. I love, I love how the Holy Spirit orchestrates things. There was no way that anybody even really knew what the title of my message was going to be besides the media people, but even the word that came forth, uh, the prophetic word that came forth, I thought the, 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 the spontaneous worship that happened was all about victory and battle and winning and God giving us victory because the Holy Spirit knows. He knows. And I just, I just stood on the front row going, thank you, Holy Spirit, for confirming that this is the word I should share. As a matter of fact, I really even talked to my wife this morning and thought about preaching something else. And I felt, no, go ahead and preach this. And I said, okay, Lord, I'll do it. And the Holy Spirit is just aligning it all up. So I'm excited to speak the word today. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to let Kayla go sit down. Amen. Father, we thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you're doing. You're an amazing, amazing God. God, I love you. I love you for what you're doing. I love you for your presence that's already here. I pray that you would speak through me to your people, God. And God, we pray that your word will fall on good soil, producing a harvest 30, 60, and 100 fold, and that you and only you would get all the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, and everybody said, amen and amen. Strategies for battle. You know, I'm reminded sometimes people don't know you, and so a lot of times I tell stories about myself and sometimes they're great stories sometimes they're kind of embarrassing I'm going to tell you a little bit of an embarrassing story about myself is that all right yeah that, that's okay well um when I was 11 years old I've been in one fight in my whole life okay one like physical like fight against somebody else like my brothers don't count come on you know what I'm talking about like that don't count you fight them all the time okay but I'm talking about like against a non-family member. I've been in one fight my entire life, and I was 11 years old when it happened. Um, it was on the, what happened was I was on the bus ride home from school, and I was in sixth grade, and I wanted to be cool. And um, just, they had eighth graders on the bus, and I was really, really just trying to get into it and try to be cool in middle school. And, and there was a kid in front of me that had just got a fresh haircut, and it was a really nice looking haircut where he had it kind of a little bit on top, but he had it nice and clean on the back. And for some reason, somebody enticed me to slap the kid in the back of the head, okay? And uh, so I did. I slapped him in the back of the head. And... Uh, Boy, the bus just started laughing. People started laughing. And I didn't realize the response I would get by doing that. So the problem is, with me, I don't know how to do things once and just let it be. So I decided to do it again. So I slapped him again, pow, right up the back of his head. The guy kind of rubs his head. And he's just like, man. And so people are laughing. I mean, it's just a whole thing. So by this point, I am really enjoying the attention. Okay? Now girls are starting to look at me, right? And I'm like, this is awesome. So this time, I lick my hand. True story. And I just ran back, pow, right up in the back of the head. I'm telling you, the bus by this point is going wild, okay? I even look at the bus driver with the big mirror, you know, the big mirror she looks through, and she's like... <laughs> And I'm like, this is awesome, all right? And so I'm having a blast. And I mean, I'm just, and this kid's not saying anything. He's just let me hit him up in the back of the head. And I'm like, this is awesome, okay? And finally, almost home, he turns around and says, hey, meet me at my bus stop. Yeah, that's what I said. I said, oh, oh, whoa. I was like, wait a second. What you want me to meet you at your bus stop for? He's like, oh, we're going to fight when we get to my bus stop. And I thought to myself, hey, I didn't want to fight you. I just wanted to hit you in the back of the head. Okay? I just wanted some attention. That's all I want. I wanted to be cool. But he was like, oh, no, we're going to fight when we get to my bus stop. And at that moment, I thought to myself, wow, I, 
I wasn't prepared for this, okay? But at that moment, I said, well, I got to get off of this bus stop. I can't be a coward. So I got off of the bus stop, and I'm telling you, from the moment I stepped off that bus, this kid hit me in the face, and I mean, he just started pummeling me, just, just beating me down. Just, I mean, and I'm swinging, and I'm kicking and throwing dust. I mean, it's just, this kid is just beating me down. And I'm telling you, I realized I did not have a strategy to fight. You know, I had all these great thoughts and I was doing all these things, but I realized at that moment, I didn't have a strategy. I was just wanting some attention, but I didn't know how I was going to win that fight. And you know, I was thinking about some Christians these days is because a lot of times Christians run around and we sing, this is how I fight my battle and all that kind of stuff. But the question is, do you have strategies to win the battle? Do you know how to win the battle? Because this is what I figured out about Christianity is that we all walk through battles. We all are going through something. We're all fighting something. And I can just tell you this, and just even if you're new, this is what I found is that either you are coming out of a battle, you're right in the middle of a battle, or let me tell you something, you're heading into a battle. Okay? You're going into a fight. There's something that you've got to deal with and there, because we have an adversary. We have an enemy who wants to come against us, and we need to be able to know how to win the battles when the enemy comes at us. We need to know how to win those battles, and we need to have strategy for it. And look, this is what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. I want you to see this. We'll put this on the screen. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against what? All strategies of the devil. All strategies of the devil. Now, when I read that, something stuck out to me. What stuck out to me was that the enemy has strategies because he's plotting against you. He's plotting against you, and he's coming up with things to try to take you out. So if the enemy has strategies, that means that we need to have strategies. Can I get a better amen? amen. We need to have strategies against the enemy. Most people don't know that I'm a, I'm a World War II fan, and, and, and I'm a big history buff. And part of the reason why I'm a big history buff is not because I like war. It's because I'm very intrigued about the strategic nature and what it takes in order to win the war and the things that had to happen in order for the war to be won. And in your life, there are areas in your life that the enemy is trying to attack you. And maybe today you're saying, man, I need some strategy on how to win the battle in my life, and that's what we're gonna do. So today, we're gonna to do three things. First of all, we're gonna identify the battles in your life. Because sometimes, you don't even realize that there is a battle in your life. You don't even know that you're walking through a battle. And we're gonna identify those things. The second thing is that we're gonna understand where those battles came from. What happened? I'm just gonna teach you some things today. Where those battles came from, and then finally, we're gonna see how we can emerge victorious because you know we were dancing earlier man i've got the victory the question is how do we get that victory amen and we're going to talk about that so what i'm going to do is i'm going to use king jehoshaphat as a person of interest and if you're pregnant and maybe you're thinking about naming your kid something i think jehoshaphat is a great name for your kid i don't know it's just just a thought i don't know but Jehoshaphat, in the Bible, for many of you don't know, maybe you've heard of the name, you're like, man, I really don't know a whole lot about Jehoshaphat. I've heard of him, but I don't know a whole lot about him. Well, let me just teach you a little bit about him. First of all, he was the fourth king in, in, in Judah, okay, and he was a good king. The Bible talks about how there were good kings and kings who did evil in the Lord's sight. Jehoshaphat was a good king. He was a great king. Matter of fact, he tore down Asherah poles, he, he, he tore down Baal images, he, he actually appointed judges, and he had them um, go out and he taught them to lead with integrity. He even taught his, his, his top officials, he told them, go and teach the book of the law to people. He did so many great things. Jehoshaphat was really, really awesome. The only thing that I really learned about Jehoshaphat, that he was known 
for the two battles that he found himself in. There's two major battles as you read through 2 Chronicles and Kings. You notice that Jehoshaphat has these two battles that he's in. And we're going to talk about that, those, those two battles and really learn from that. So the question is, is this, and this is, this is the thought, though, I want to give you this, and you can write this down, that even though Jehoshaphat was, was, did so many great things and he did so much for the Lord, even though he did that, sometimes good people still go through battles. And I think this is important for you to understand because there's a myth and there's a, maybe somebody has lied to you and somebody has preached to you and said, hey, when you get saved, Everything's going to be great. Everything's going to be perfect. You're not going to go through anything. Let me just debunk that right now and just tell you, when you walk through things, you still will go through battles. Can somebody say amen? amen. Anybody who's ever gone through a battle in here, can you say amen? amen? Yeah. Yeah, you serve the Lord, and you would think, man, things are going to be awesome, but it doesn't keep you from going through battles. So what is a battle? All right, well, I'm going to give you a Wayne Brown de definition, okay, you ready? A battle is any obstacle that continues to exist despite adhering to God's principles and prevents you from fulfilling his intended purpose for your life. Any obstacle that continues to persist after adhering to God's principles. Now, I put that in there on purpose. Because sometimes we call things battles, and all we've got to do is just go and apply God's word to certain things, and it's not really a battle. Okay? This is important. Because sometimes people go, man, I'm in a financial battle. And the first thing I ask them is, like, are you tithing? And they go, uh, uh, no. I was like, well, you're not in a battle. You're just under the curse. That's all that is. It's no big deal. Right? You've got to understand what a battle is. It's like, hey, after I've applied God's principles, but there still is an obstacle that's there. And that happens. There's times when you're doing what's right, you're serving God, but there's an obstacle that persists and stands in your way and is hindering you from fulfilling God's purpose. That is a battle in your life. And we have to identify those things as battles. Some of you, you're walking through battles right now in your mind. You're walking through battles in your family. You're walking through battles of addiction. And you're walking through those things. And sometimes we're denying those things and we're saying, oh, no, you know, that's not that really, that's not that big of a deal. I, I, I can stop drinking any time. You, you know, that's not that really big of a thing with my, with my marriage. That's just, you know, we argue sometimes. Yeah, argue sometimes, but not all the time. Okay? And if you continue in going through these things and you're continually talking about divorce, you're going through a battle. And what you have to do is, is you have to identify that it is a battle so you can start to know how to attack the battle so you can get victory. Can somebody say amen? amen. See, if we don't identify, the thing that the enemy would love for you to do is to not identify what you're walking through. He would love for you to deny it and say, oh, it's no big deal. Oh, this thing with my kids? Oh, yeah, I mean, all kids are rebellious. No, when your kid is away from the Lord and you've been praying for them and you want them to come back and you keep praying for them and they don't come back, you're going through a battle. And you need to identify that and start acting like you're going through a battle and treat it like a battle. Am I making sense? Start praying like it's a battle. Start believing God like it's a battle. Start getting some other people to pray with you so you can win the battle. Can somebody say Amen bad habits and struggles and things like that. We can't minimize those things. We have to identify them as battles. You know the reason why battles take place is because somebody wants to access and gain territory in, 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 a, in, in somebody else's life. And you know what the enemy wants to do? The enemy wants to gain access and territory in your life. That's the reason why you're walking through a battle. You're walking through a mental battle because the enemy wants access and territory in your mind. And so the reason why it's hard to get those images out of your mind is because the enemy wants to have access and territory in your mind. That's why you have to say, no, I'm in a battle, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to win this battle. Can somebody say amen? Amen. 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 So these two battles that I see Jehoshaphat in in 2 Chronicles chapter 18 and 2 Chronicles chapter 20, let me explain these two battles to you, and then we're going to learn something from them, and then I'm going to sit down. The first thing 
that we see is this battle over here, which is a battle that he gets in because he's connected to King Ahab. Okay, King Ahab is the king of Israel. All right, he's the king of Judah. Remember, um, remember the, king, the children of Israel, they broke up and they had two different kings. And so King Ahab, this is the saying Ahab and Jezebel, King Ahab is over here and he wants to attack Ramoth Gilead because Ben-Hadad, this old king, didn't give him some property that he, he told him he would give him. And so he goes to Jehoshaphat and says, hey, let's combine our forces and let's marry and let's do things and let's move forward and let's attack Ramoth Gilead. Okay, so what he does is, is that Jehoshaphat allows his son to marry um, Ahab's daughter and they get into an alliance and they get ready to go attack Ramoth Gilead. Okay, that's battle number one. Okay, battle number two is over here. And really, Jehoshaphat's not doing anything but minding his own business. And the Ammonites and the Minyanites and the Moabites all decided they're just going to come together and they're going to attack him. Okay, for no reason. They just want to attack him because they want to take his land. Remember, it's about territory. So you got two battles that's going on. Okay. Now, the question is, is how are battles started? And I want to talk to you about this because I believe this is going to help somebody where battles come from. If you're not taking notes, you need to go ahead and write this down right here. Okay? Write this down. Number one, how do battles start? Some battles start because they're generational. Okay? Because sometimes we feel like, man, you know, that little fight that I started on the bus, that was my fault. I started that. Okay? But some battles you end up in are not battles that you, you started. Some of them are generational battles, okay? Battles that's been going on long before you were even born, but nobody ever got to victory in it, and so you're dealing with it. Come on, I'm helping somebody in here right now. Some, somebody say, well, I don't believe you, Pastor Wayne. Well, let me prove it to you. So you got Abraham. Y'all know who Abraham is, right? Abraham has this little situation, his wife, where he goes and he gets an opportunity to either tell the truth and say that this is his wife or his sister. And so the Bible says that he lies and he deceives and he says, no, this is my sister. And he lies and he almost, he almost um, uh, um, the, 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 the king almost kills, kills him because he was like, hey, no, this is really your sister. And, and so he deceives in this moment. And so it was just this one little thing. It's just Abraham. He just, he just lied. It was a little white lie. You know, it's just a little deception. No big deal. But then Abraham has a son named Isaac, and Isaac gets in the same situation where he gets to say this is his wife or his sister, and guess what he does? He says this is his sister. Okay? So one little deception here, another little deception here. Okay? Now Isaac has a son named what? Jacob. Okay? You know what Jacob means? Deceiver. Wow. Wow. So you have, you have a grandfather who had a little bit of deception in his life, who passed it down to, the, to his son, and he had a little deception. Now his grandsons, his whole identity is deception. And the thing that he had to battle was deception. He was a trickster. He was constantly tricking and doing different things. And that's why when he encountered God, God said, I have to change your name. You will no longer be Jacob. I will name you Israel because I will not let this keep passing on and on to the next generation. Somebody has to break the cycle. Come on, I'm preaching in here right now. Somebody has to break the cycle. And some things are passed from one generation to the next. Yet yeah, grandfather dealt with a little bit of alcohol. And then all of a sudden dad dealt with it. And now for some reason you feel like, man, I feel like I just got to have a drink. Somebody has to break the, the, the cycle. Somebody has to break it. Somebody has to do it. And, it's, and so some of you, you're fighting battles that you didn't even start. But you need to go back and see where it started so you could be the one to break the cycle and don't pass it on to the next generation. Amen. Can I tell you something? Your kids are counting on you to break the cycle. Yes. Your kids are counting on you. There are some things right now that I do not deal with because my dad broke the cycle. 
And there's some things I'm dealing with right now that I know if I don't get the victory, I'm going to pass it on to my little boy. And I know that I have to get the victory and break the cycle. Break the cycle of divorce. Break the cycle of poverty. Break the cycle. Just break the cycle of looking at inappropriate images. Break the cycle and say, you know what? I will not pass it on. Some of the battles you're fighting are not for you. It's for your next generation. See? And so you have to be able to break it because if not, you will pass it on. So some battles are generational. Some are by association. Jehoshaphat was over here. He got in this battle. And the only reason he was in this battle was because he was connected to Ahab. He didn't want to fight. Um, he didn't want to go to Ramoth Gilead. He was just in this battle because of who he was connected to. Some of the battles that you're fighting is because of who you're connected to. I want you to think about that. See, sometimes we deal with anxiety, and it's because everybody around us is dealing with anxiety. Sometimes we deal with doubt and fear. It's because everybody around us is dealing with doubt and fear. And that's why it's important to start figuring out who am I surrounding myself with? Because if I don't have joy, it might be because everybody around me don't have joy. It's because everybody I call is like, yeah, I know, Lord, stuff, life is hard. Right? And you like, well, I mean, I, I guess life is hard too, yeah. Right? That's why it's important who you surround yourself with. That's why I say get connected to a great church like this and get around some believers who are running around talking about, I got the victory. That's who you need to be connected to. <laughs> right? Somebody you can call on the phone when life gets tough and say, no, we're going to make it. God is a big God. He's still on the throne. We can make it. Get connected to people like that. Some of your friends that you've been flying around with is, is the wrong people. You want to soar like an eagle, but you're hanging out with turkeys. Come on now. <laughs> right? And you're hanging around with these turkeys, and you can't, get, you can't get where you want to get. Who you're connected to matters. And some of the battles that you're fighting is really because of the people you're connected to. That's why I always tell single people, catch this, be careful who you marry. Because whatever, you, whatever battles they're fighting... That's going to all be interconnected to yours, too. All right? And that's okay because you got battles. They got battles. You get to fight them together. But just be careful because somebody, you might look at their battles and go, mm -mm, I don't want to fight them battles. <laughs> she cute, but she ain't that cute. Come on now. <laughs> she got too many battles. Lord, have mercy. Right? But be careful by association. And then the third thing is that you can be some of it is just really the enemy. There are some battles, I'm telling you, you're not, you didn't do anything wrong. It's not because of generational, not because of association. Some of it is just the enemy. Because we do have an adversary who does not like us. And sometimes he throws stuff at us. I, our founding, not founding pastor, but our second pastor, so we have a founding pastor, and then his son, Pastor Larry, who I consider as a spiritual father, just all of a sudden just... The enemy started attacking his body, and he started dealing with sickness. And I'm talking about not to the point of, like, just sickness. I'm talking about to the point where he was about to die. And people were flying in to come pray with him and, 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 and say their last remarks to him. And I watched him. I watched him go from a healthy person to somebody who, was, who had lost 40 pounds and was, was on a walker. And we didn't think he was going to make it. And it was just an attack from the enemy. But you knew what? The thing that I love about it is that he knew he was in a battle. And he began to fight. And he would not relent. And he had a fire in his eyes. And even though he was weak in his body, he had fires in, fire in his eyes. And he kept going, the devil will not get victory in this situation. And can I just tell you something? Let me tell you something. He is getting the victory in that situation. And he's alive. He's gained all those 40 pounds back. He's traveling and preaching the gospel. He preached a couple weeks ago at Bethany. God is using him because he knew he was in a battle. And it was just a battle from the enemy. It's not because of who he was connected to. It was just the devil don't like what he's doing. 
And some of you, you're in those kind of battles. Okay, that's how battles start. So how do we win the, the battle? Okay, I'm glad you asked. Here we go. I've got 10 minutes to tell you how we win the battle. You ready? All right. So you got these two battles that I just talked about. And the one thing that I love about Jehoshaphat is in battle one, and he did the same thing in battle two, he asked, he said, Ahab, before we go into battle, let's see what the Lord has to say. And any time you get yourself and you find yourself getting ready to go into battle or you even find yourself in a battle, one of the first things you need to do is you need to seek the Lord and see what the Lord has to say about your situation. Sometimes the first thing we do is stuff start going wrong and we start calling everybody we know, right? You know, we start calling mama and we start calling everybody. We start calling. Let me ask you something. When was the last time you got yourself in a bad situation and the first person you called on was the Lord? Like, Lord, what do you have to say in this situation? Right? Seek the Lord. That's what he did. They call in this prophet, Micaiah, and he began to talk about what was going to happen. He told Ahab he was going to die. But he, he wanted to know, Jehoshaphat wanted to know what was going to happen. He sought the Lord. Over here, he did the same thing. These armies started to march against him. And he said, you know what? Let's seek the Lord. Let's call a time of prayer and fasting. We need to know what the Lord is saying about this situation. Because what Jehoshaphat learned was that, hey, you know what? I need to know what God is saying. Because if God is for me and he's with me and I know what he's saying, I know how to move. Right? I won't act out of emotions. I know how to move. The second thing that I love about this is this. So you sought the Lord. The second thing I would say that Jehoshaphat has to do is you do have to put on the right armor. Okay? Now, in this battle, Jehoshaphat got to a place where he put on his kingly armor. All right? And this is the reason why. Because Ahab said, hey, look, I'm going to disguise myself because I know that they want to kill me. And I'm going to put on plain clothes. And Jehoshaphat, I want you to put on the king's armor so if they start shooting at anybody, they'll shoot at you. Okay? Wow, that's a real good plan. Okay? And so Jehoshaphat put on that armor. But that armor to me was the armor of, natural, of the natural. Just, okay, this is just the natural. But over here, what he did was he said, look, we're going to get on our face and we're going to seek the Lord. We're going to go in prayer. We're going to get it before the Lord. And that's the armor of the spirit. And what I feel like Jehoshaphat learned from that battle was that, you know what, I'm not going to put on natural armor. I'm going to put on the armor of the spirit. Because I know when I put on the armor of the spirit, I know that he's going to fight for me. That scripture I read in Ephesians 6, it said, put on, the, put on God's armor. Put on the whole armor of God. And he put on the right armor and began to know, hey, you know what? I'm not, I don't have to fight in the natural. All I got to do is fight in the spirit. And I'm telling you right now, some of you, you're, in the, you're trying to fight things in the natural. Well, you need to fight it in the spirit. You're in a battle at your job, and you want to go and tell your boss something, and, you, and somebody's talking about you, and you want to go say something. Listen, that's in the natural. What you need to do is go get on your knees and say, God, you fight my battles for me. Lord, I need you to deal with this. Lord, I need you to work this thing out. I know if I was going to go work it out, I would go slap somebody. Come on now. But for me, God, I need to do this thing not in the natural. I need to do it in the spirit. I'm going to tell you right now, part of the reason I'm here right now is because my mom and dad fought in the spirit for me. They fought in the spirit for me. I had gotten away from God. I was out in the world doing all kind of crazy stuff, and my mom and dad, they didn't come and, and try to beat me with the word of God. They just got on their knees and they prayed. And they prayed, and they prayed, and they would not stop praying. And you know what? Today, they're still praying for me, and I thank God for it because they won the battle in the spirit. They wanted it, they put on the right armor. And I don't know who I'm talking to today, but I want to encourage you, put on the right armor. Don't put on the armor of the natural. There's things that you can try to do in the natural that's not going to work. And then finally, I love this. Jehoshaphat in battle won. So they started to shoot at him because they thought he was the king. They thought he was the king of Israel, and he wasn't. And the Bible says that he cried out to the Lord. And God saved him out of it. 
And then over in this battle over here, over here, he does something that I think is super important. I'm going to read this scripture in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15. One of the men, because he called a time of fasting, one of the men, Jehaziel, decides he's going to stand up and, and preach and, and prophesy. And I love what he says. Now, Jehaziel, that sounds like a, like a black guy to me. I like that. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like I got a cousin named Jehaziel or something. I, I, don't, I, don't, know. I don't know. All right. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 50. <laughs> Jehaziel says, listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Do not or don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but it's God's. Come on now. I don't know who I'm encouraging in here right now, but this is Jehaziel prophesying to you. He says, tomorrow march out against them. You will find them coming up through the ascent of Ziz at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Jeruel. But you will not even need to fight. Take your position. Then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. He is with you. O people of Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid or discouraged. Go out against them, uh, them tomorrow, for the Lord is with you. This is what I love. In both times, what he figured out he had to do is that he needed to allow the Lord to fight his battle. I'm going to tell you right now, there's some battles you have to fight, and there's some battles you don't need to fight. You just need to let the Lord fight your battle. Just let the Lord fight your battle. Just let him fight it. But he said, do three things. He said, take your position. He didn't say run. He said, take your position. Let me just tell you something. There are certain things that you have to do is that you have to take your position, and you need to let the enemy know, I'm not afraid of you. Yeah, yeah, I know you're throwing stuff at me, but I'm not afraid of you. I'm not intimidated by you. I'm going to stand right here, and I'm going to praise God no matter what. In the face of adversity, I'm going to take my position. I think we need some Christians to start taking their position again. We need some people, some believers to start taking their position and say, you know, I'm going to take my position, and I'm going to stand still. I'm going to stand still. I'm not going to run. I'm going to stand right here in the face of adversity, and I'm not going to run. And you know what the Lord said to me about that? Standing still means you're going to stay planted. Stay planted. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but the Lord is saying stay planted. Stop running every time something comes up and things get difficult. Stay planted. You don't need to run out of that marriage. Stay planted in that marriage. Come on now. Stay planted. Stay planted in the local church. Yeah, I know things are hard and things are difficult and you want to cry and you want to go hide in the closet somewhere. God say, stay planted. Stand still and know that he's with you and watch what he's going to do for you. I've been serving God long enough that I've seen with my own eyes God win battles for me. Things that I've wanted to do and things that I've wanted to jump in, but God has said, nope. Watch me do it for you. I don't know what battle you're in right now. But I'm telling you, God is saying, watch what I can do. Watch what I can do. If you would take your position, stand still and watch. As I close, I'm going to close with this story. We have a campus. <coughs> we have a campus in Puerto Rico. And I've been to Puerto Rico four times. I was there in April. And we took a team down. And there's a place in Puerto Rico called Old San Juan. And it's a beautiful, beautiful area. It's a real touristy area. Right there on the coast, the water is there. There's a lot of history that's there. And it's beautiful. I've gone every time that I've gone down. And I've seen things, I've seen forts and what have you, but this time, one of the native residents of Puerto Rico, she took us on a prayer walk through that area. And she, as we would walk through, she said, and let me just tell you about this wall, and let me tell you about these gates. Let me tell you what this is. 
And she took us to this monument. We're going to put it on the screen because I want you to see it. To this place called La Rogatiga. Okay. This is statue. La Rogatiga. And I remember her talking about it and I was like, what is this all about? And she said, in 1797, a British army, um, a naval army, put together a, a blockade. And because Puerto Rico is an island, they begin to come with all of their ships. And they begin to get ready to attack the island of Puerto Rico. And it was a huge naval blockade. And the governor of San Juan didn't know what to do. He knew he didn't have the resources. He knew he didn't have enough people. And so what he did was he just ran into the city and he called a rogatiba. And what a rogatiba is, is, is it's a processional. It's a, it's a prayer walk. And so what he did was he grabbed the bishop and they, and they grabbed some ladies and they got some torches and they got some bells. True story, 1797. Go read this, I'm not making it up. And they grabbed some torches and some bells and they began to walk the streets of Puerto Rico praying. They knew they didn't have enough to fight. They, didn't, they knew they didn't have anything. They knew that that all they, that they needed the Lord to fight for them. So as they're praying, as they're walking, the naval army and the British commander begin to get scared because they thought, oh my gosh, they got reinforcements with them. And so because of that, the entire Navy blockade and the entire Navy troops, they all turned their ships and they fled in retreat because of one bishop and three ladies who said, you know what, we're going to pray and we're going to take our position and we're not going to run from them. We're going to stand there because we know that we have a God that's for us and that's with us. One bishop, three ladies ran off a whole naval fleet. Can you believe that? That's wild. But it shows that you know what? When you have God on your side, he can fight for you. And I don't know what battles you're facing today, but I'm telling you, God is on your side. And there, he's, more for, there's, he's better for you than the enemy can try to bring against you. So I'm going to pray today, and I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. And as we close, I felt by the Spirit that there are some people in the room, you're walking through a battle. You're walking through a battle and you know it. Some of you are walking through personal battles. Some of you are walking through battles as a couple in your family. That's okay. Some of you, you may be feeling like, man, I'm fighting a generational battle. God wants to see you emerge victorious. And if it took me to come over here to San Antonio to tell you that he's with you, that he's for you, and that you will get the victory because he already won the victory on the cross.